guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video and I'm really happy to announce that this video is once again sponsored by Skillshare. You may remember that I worked with them last month and we got some really good feedback so I'm working with them again. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 25,000 classes in pretty much anything you can imagine. Last month I learned a bit of Spanish with my three minute Spanish classes which I'm still going strong at and really really enjoying those classes but this month I've also been learning how to make a podcast. If you do follow me over on Twitter then you may have seen that I was having what I can only describe as an existential crisis about my YouTube career and so I've just been searching for new ways that I can improve and expand my brand here on the internet. So when I saw a class on Skillshare about how to make a podcast, how to plan, record and launch with success, I figured I'd learn how to make a podcast, which I've now done. I'm not promising you guys that I'm going to start a podcast anytime soon, but Skillshare has shown me that it is an option available to me. If I want to do it, then I very much can do. They actually have loads of classes about freelancing, running your own business and things like that, which I'd never thought to really search for before, but they are all incredible and I'm definitely going to be like dipping into pretty much all of them just so I can make my platform here on YouTube as good as it possibly can be. A premium membership will give you unlimited access so you can join all the classes you want and teach yourself about things that you think are important. Skillshare is giving away a free two month unlimited access trial to whoever clicks the link in the description down below, it'll be in the first line. And then after that two months, it's only about $10, £7 a month. So it's a really good deal. Definitely go check Skillshare out highly highly recommend. And with that let's get into talking about this week's case which is one that you may have heard of before. It is often referred to as the silent twins, the case of June and Jennifer Gibbons. I've put off covering it for a while because a lot of people do talk about it but it's just something I find so incredibly fascinating that I couldn't hold off any longer. I just want to share this story with you. So June and Jennifer were born on April 11th 1963 at an RAF base in Aden, Yemen to their parents Gloria and Aubrey Gibbons. June was born first with Jennifer coming along just 10 minutes later but it was pretty apparent from birth that Jennifer was the much stronger twin, she was much more alert. They were the third and fourth children in their families, they had their older sister Greta and their older brother David. Gloria and Aubrey were originally from Barbados but they had lived in England since 1960. But at the time that the twins were born they'd actually been deployed to Yemen as Aubrey worked as a technician with the RAF. In late 1963, the same year the twins were born, the family returned to England settling at an RAF base in Linton, Yorkshire. A couple of years later the couple had their fifth and final child, another girl called Rosie. Um, but as sort of Rosie became older, it became quite apparent that the twins were pretty delayed in terms of their speech. I mean, as toddlers, they could speak three or four words at most. They couldn't string sentences together and Rosie quickly overtook them in this aspect. They'd make sounds and they'd babble mostly to each other but they weren't really at the same level that other children their age were. And of course with Aubrey's job in the RAF the family moved around a lot from base to base throughout the UK. Um, when the twins were eight the family moved to Devon and they started a new school along with that. They had been working on their speech and they would talk to their family when it was required but they still wouldn't speak to other people outside of their immediate family. So this was the UK in the 19th 1970s, June, Jennifer and their siblings were often the only black children in their schools. And as well as this they were always the new kids, always moving from school to school throughout their entire childhood, so they never were entirely settled anywhere. The children were cruel, they were racist and they would verbally attack the twins on a daily basis and the twins were a particular target because as well as their skin colour they were also mute, they had selective mutism, they wouldn't speak to anyone and this made them a target. And so as what we can assume is a result of this racism, the twins completely retreated back into themselves. They wouldn't speak to anyone, they wouldn't even make eye contact. They wouldn't even speak to their family, the only people they would speak to were each other. Their parents said that they could hear them chattering away to each other in their bedroom so they knew that they had the ability to talk but just wouldn't talk to anyone else. But also this wasn't English that the twins were speaking to each other, their parents couldn't understand 
a word that they said. It sounded like some kind of very, very fast made up language. Um, it was later discovered that they were actually speaking a mixture of UK English and Barbadian slang, but they were speaking it so, so quickly that nobody could understand apart from the other. In 1974, when the twins were 11 years old, the family moved once again to Haverford West in Wales, to a house on the RAF estate there. The twins attend Haverford West County Secondary School, along with their brother David. Greta has now sort of aged out of school and it's in Haverford West that the bullying steps up another notch. Haverford West was a very small closed off community and it was pretty much known for its racism. It was very much one type of person there, all white people and so when this black family moved to town everyone knew about it and it seems that the twins were bullied by pretty much every single child in their school purely for the colour of their skin and their silence meant that never once did they fight back. The bullying was actually so severe that the girls had to be dismissed from school five minutes before the rest of their classmates so they could get a head start on the walk home and hopefully miss the bullies. In 1976 a school medical officer called John Reese comes to the school to give all the children their tuberculosis vaccinations and the only black girls in this school stood out to him, but not only for the colour of their skin. He said that he was giving all of the children the vaccinations and he comes across these twins and they just put their arm out and they don't react at all to anything, to him rubbing the alcohol on their skin, to him putting the needles in their skin. It's like they're not even there, they're like in trance-like state and they don't react to anything going on around them. And he picks up on this. He's so baffled by the twins' behaviour that he actually goes to the school's headmaster to tell them what was going on. But the headmaster just dismisses his worry, saying that the girls aren't troubled children. But Reese is actually so concerned that he actually goes and refers the girls' case to a child psychiatrist in the region. Now, doesn't sort of talk to the parents at any point about any of this, from what I can gather. He just does it. And this psychiatrist actually tries to have a meeting with the twins. But of course, they refuse to talk to him. He says if he can't communicate with the girls then there's nothing he can do for them and so he refers them up the ladder to a different psychiatrist named Anne Trehan. She's the chief speech therapist at the nearby hospital and the girls still refuse to speak to her but eventually she manages to get them to agree that if she left the room could they speak on tape that she could listen to later. And they do agree to this, they speak to each other whilst they're being taped and it's actually at this point that Anne discovers that they're speaking a mixture of UK English and Barbadian slang and it's all just very very sped up. She also discovers that they had some slight speech issues, a slight lisp. Anne also noticed that Jennifer very much seemed to be the twin in charge, that she had some sort of weird power over June. Anne said that at many points she saw that June was more willing to open up, June would go to speak and say something, but she'd get given this quick look by Jennifer and she would just shut up. On the back of all this, the girls are transferred to a different school that's supposed to help them with their speech issues, the Eastgate Centre for Special Education. Aubrey and Gloria actually said that they had no idea what was going on with their girls at any point. They were just told what was going to happen and then it happened. Not that this new school helped them in any way. They still refused to speak or communicate with anyone. They were entirely silent in their own little bubble. They seemed to be the only people in this world of theirs. And people would actually say they were scared of them. They were really creeped out by these two silent twins. And that's not gonna go over my head. I am pretty sure the reason that people were scared of them wasn't just the fact that they were silent. It was also probably due to racism as well. And so the people in charge decide that the only option they've got available to them now is to separate the twins. That separating them will help them learn who they are singularly instead of just this one twin person. And they also wanted to figure out which twin was the one holding all the power. But as soon as this idea was mentioned to the girls, they lost it. They started like physically fighting, like clawing each other's skin, pulling each other's hair, and they had to be dragged apart by adults. But they suddenly decide that now is the time to start speaking and they beg not to be separated. 
doesn't make a difference and they're separated regardless in March 1978. Once apart, the girls fall into a catatonic state. It's like they don't know how to function when they're not together. They refuse to get out of bed, they don't react to anything whatsoever. June would just lie in bed all day, every day, and when people tried to move her, her body was as stiff as a corpse, and they literally had to like prop her up against the wall just to like get her to stand straight she just was stiff she refused to move needless to say that separation didn't work for either of them and when they left school a year later in 1979 at age 16 they both just went back to how they were before their bond was a strange one psychiatrists say they got the impression that the two of them actually hated each other there was no love there it was just hatred they regularly wrote notes saying they wanted the other one to die or that they wanted to be separated. They wanted one of them to go to Barbados and one of them to go to America. But when they were approached with the reality of living apart, they just lost it. It definitely seemed like Jennifer was the more dominant twin. She was in control of June and everything she did. But the twins felt as if they were one person. They were the same person living in two separate bodies constantly tortured by the other. Imagine looking up no matter where you are in life and all you see is this person who's identical to you in every way. You'd feel like you're being haunted by yourself. They could communicate with like a simple eye gesture and their movements pretty much always exactly shadowed the others. They had strange little rituals between them. They'd decide who would be the first one to wake up in the morning. They would decide who was gonna be the twin to breathe first when they woke up. The other twin wasn't allowed to breathe until the other one did. They just had complete control of each other. So when the girls were 16, they left school, they returned to Haverford West and this separation obviously hadn't had their desired effect because now it just made them realise that they literally couldn't function without the other. So their bond was stronger than ever. And now they had the added fear of somebody trying to separate them again. They once again refused to speak to anyone, including their family, apart from their younger sister, Rosie. When they did want to communicate with their families, they would simply write notes for them. Things like, hey, we want to watch this TV programme at 7.30 tonight, can you leave the living room door open? So the girls could then watch TV without actually having to be in the same room as their family. And they would sit in their rooms all day, every day, just with each other, playing elaborate games with their dolls. They'd play games of families with their dolls. And there was always twins involved in these families. Um, for Christmas that year, they actually got given a diary by their mother and they begin to write. And they discover that they really, really love writing. So they enrol in a creative writing course and they enrol as one single person and they decide that they're going to become authors. That's what they're going to do with their lives. They write stories, poems, novels all day, every day, often involving young men and women exhibiting very strange and criminal behaviours. Um, it became quite a helpful outlet for them, it would help them get their thoughts and feelings out onto paper, but it sort of showed how strange their view of the world was because these novels they were writing were so, I suppose, disturbed in a way. June actually wrote a novel called Pepsi Cola Addict about a high school hero who is seduced by his teacher, so then he's then sent away to a reformatory school where a gay guard then tries it on with him. And they actually got this published by a fancy press, so basically a sort of like self-published kind of thing. Um, and they write many, many more novels after this one, each one as strange as the one before, but they don't get any more of them published. As they enter their late teen years, they begin to experiment with drugs and alcohol, feeling that the drugs and alcohol made them more open. They were more willing to talk to people when they were on these substances. And they also discover boys. They take a particular shine to one boy who was an American living in Hanford West, and they actually break into this boy's home. They would later go on to lose their virginities, this boy's brother. And yeah, they both lost their virginities to the same boy with the other twin watching. They become petty criminals 
theft, vandalism, shoplifting at every opportunity. But they eventually get bored of being these small time criminals and June writes in her diary, I'm planning on making petrol bombs, a bottle, petrol and paper, then hurl it through the window. I'm going to be the biggest arsonist around. On October 24th, 1981, they burn down a tractor store and they delight in the fire as it burns and they go home and write about this experience in detail in their diaries. They really enjoyed the experience of watching this place burn to the ground. Then on November 8th, they smash a window at the Pembroke Technical College and a nearby policeman catches them just as they're about to light a fire and obviously they get arrested. Um, on the back of this arrest, their bedroom is searched and the police find all of these diaries where they have literally spoken about every single crime they've ever committed. And of course, this is used as evidence that they're criminals. Of course, their worst crime being the fact that they burnt down the tractor store. They were very, very lucky that no one died. So they're sent to a remand center for seven months whilst the system tries to decide what to do with them. They're young, they're not even out of their late teens yet, and they don't speak. They don't speak to anyone. This selective mutism doesn't help their case. So now instead of being trapped in a bedroom at home together, they're now trapped in a prison cell in bunk beds in a very, very similar setup to what it was at home. But there's no escape. They're now confined together 24 seven. And it's the strangest relationship because like I said, as dependent as they were on each other, they hated each other. A deep burning hatred where they would fantasize about killing the other. And June described Jennifer as her shadow. She wrote, how can I get rid of my own shadow? Impossible or not impossible. Without my shadow, would I die? Without my shadow, would I gain life? In the spring of 1982, a psychiatrist is enlisted by the twins defense lawyer to evaluate their condition and this psychiatrist found it as hard to evaluate them as any other psychiatrist they'd ever encountered because they wouldn't speak to him. Eventually, one of the twins started to open up only to have the other twin physically attack her and once again, they had to be pulled apart. He eventually diagnoses them with a psychopathic personality disorder and has them sent to Broadmoor, which is one of the most notorious high security psychiatric hospitals in the UK everyone's heard of Broadmoor. It's really not that far from where I live. Every Monday at 10 a.m. you hear the Broadmoor alarm. I'm talking like high, high security. Looking at Broadmoor from the outside is intimidating. It's a scary place to look at. I can't imagine living in Broadmoor. Um, it's the kind of place where the worst of the worst descent. I mean, people like Robert Maudsley, Ronnie Cray, Peter Sutcliffe, who is also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, just to name a few. So these teenage girls being sent to Broadmoor was a big deal. The psychiatrist that sent the girls to Broadmoor said that he had no other choice. There was no other hospital in the UK that was willing to accept them with their past of arson. The only other option available to them would have been prison and prison would have been no help at all. So there was reasoning, but it was ridiculous for two 19 year old girls to be sent to somewhere as serious as Broadmoor. It meant that they were immediately labeled as psychopaths and that was that. But in reality, the issue was a lot deeper than that. They weren't psychopaths, but nobody could understand the nuances of their mental condition. And all centered on the fact that they were twins and they felt trapped with one another. In May 1982, they are tried on 16 counts of burglary, theft and arson. They plead guilty and they are sentenced to a stay at Broadmoor indefinitely under the Mental Health Act 1963. So basically they're to go to Broadmoor until eventually someone deems them fit to be back in society. They would remain at Broadmoor for 11 years. Most juvenile delinquents would get a couple of years in prison at most. June and Jennifer got 11 years in a high security psychiatric hospital, mostly just down to their selective mutism because people thought that this made them dangerous. At first, when they arrived, they're placed on very high doses of antipsychotic medication, which is eventually adjusted to be lower to allow them to get on with their life and to allow them to continue writing their diaries. 
all of their doctors thought that them writing these diaries was a very good thing for them. It was an outlet for them. They're placed onto separate wards and they're not allowed to see each other. June wouldn't speak at first for weeks. She refused to speak to anyone. Jennifer would speak to people, but it was unintelligible. People had no idea what she was trying to say. Um, June actually tries and fails to commit suicide. After a while, doctors put them on the same ward just to see how they would get on, but they would just constantly physically fight. Um, but June would later go on to say that they became known as the Queens of Broadmoor. Every doctor who would review their case would always recommend that they would stay on the ward for another one or two years, that they weren't ready to be put back into society. But at this point they had begun to talk, they'd begun to communicate freely. They were so aware of what was happening to them and this is so important to remember, these girls didn't speak, that was their choice, they chose not to speak to anyone other than each other. But their minds were completely fine, they had no actual issues. They were incredibly intelligent, their writing is incredible to read. They were very eloquent and very succinct with their words when they were writing it down. So they had the ability to understand everything that was going on with them, they just chose not to speak to anyone. Eventually they've been in there for years and years and years, they start to write letters to people begging people to help them get out of there. They write to the Home Office, they even write to the Queen asking for her pardon. And they obviously never really get any response, they never get any help. Doctor after doctor just writes them off again and again and again, until eventually a journalist named Marjorie Wallace hears of their case. And Marjorie becomes their advocate, she starts writing newspaper articles about their story, gets their story out there. Their story becomes known by the public and it sort of becomes a symbol of the English criminal system and of the systematic racism that put them there. Now I'm not sure if this is directly off the back of Marjorie's work, but eventually in 1993, the twins are transferred to a minimum security clinic, the Caswell Clinic in Bridgend in Wales. They're almost 30 years old at this point, they missed out the entirety of their 20s stuck at Broadmoor and they were really excited to finally get out of there even if it is just to another clinic. However, by the time they arrive at the Caswell Clinic, Jennifer can't be roused. Um, she's taken to the hospital where she dies quickly of acute myocarditis, which is a sudden inflammation of the heart. There's no evidence of anything causing this condition, it was just a very strange sudden death. June later said at the inquest that Jennifer had been acting strangely in the day before her death, that she had been slurring her speech, and apparently she even told June that she was going to die. Jennifer was of course heartbroken by her sister's death, it was like a part of herself dying, she didn't know what to do with herself. But she was also quoted as saying, I'm free at last, liberated, and at last Jennifer has given her life up for me. There had apparently been a lot of discussion between the two of them at Broadmoor that it was necessary for one of them to die, for the other one to live. Jennifer agreed to give up her life for June and strangely enough it seems like she managed to make this happen. It was such a strange sudden death, acute myocarditis, like just an inflammation of the heart and she died, that was it. A year after Jennifer's death, June is released from Caswell and she goes on to live in a halfway house before moving into her own home and from then on she chose to be known as Alison, which was her middle name. She said that she felt the name June was a bad omen for her, so now she's Alison. She assimilated perfectly back into society and now she's just a regular woman living a regular life, just with a very strange past. And she stopped writing as well, she said that now she com can communicate with her own words, she no longer felt the need to put her thoughts down on paper. She's no longer monitored by psychiatric services and she's accepted Jennifer's death saying that it was necessary for Jennifer to die for her to live her full life. This is just a truly fascinating case in every way, it really makes you question what does it mean to be a twin, an identical twin? Would they have ended up where they did if they'd been raised in a more accepting community? How much did the constant bullying and racism cause them to invert into this strange little world they created? I really don't think this story's a mystery in any way, it's a very interesting story to tell but it's more of a cautionary tale I'd say, as to how someone's environment, how the people around a person 
can cause them to grow up. Were their crimes wrong? Of course, and they're really lucky that nobody died in the process. But in a world where they weren't accepted by anyone, where they spent the majority of their early teen years being poked and prodded by doctors and psychiatrists who were convinced that something was wrong with them, they were made to feel completely abnormal for their selective mutism, so it's no wonder that they started to act out. If they were white, would they have ended up in Broadmoor for 11 years? It's hard to know the answer to that for certain, but I'm inclined to say probably not. But then again, if they were white, they probably wouldn't have faced the kind of childhood that they did, and therefore they wouldn't have grown up to commit the crimes that they did. So imagine growing up in a world where you don't feel accepted by anyone, and you've got this identical twin who you feel is the other part of you that you can't get rid of. The other twin is a constant reminder of everything you faced growing up, and now she's there. She's there all the time. You can't live with her and you can't live without her. And it's bound to drive a person a little bit mad. I think this case is gonna incite some really interesting discussions down below. How much do you think racism had to do with what happened to them? How much do you think being a twin affected them? How much do you think their selective mutism affected them? Let me know all of your thoughts down below. Um, before I end this video, I just wanna give a huge thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this once again. Don't forget to check out the link in the top line of the description. Um, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next one. Bye guys.